All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And like they said, and like others have said, uh, this is going to be a cordial, friendly space. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Uh, everybody gets one and then a, a follow up. And then, you know, if other hands uh, are already up, then you're going to uh, wait until your your second turn to ask questions just simple as that so if you have a question with a follow no, no problems but uh don't continue on after and after and after if you have another question just wait for, for your turn okay there's a big uh, several people have sent me questions about what afosi does or is um, there's a lot of people out there that post things about OSI, and they don't even have the abbreviation right. They'll call it Air Force um, Office of Scientific Intelligence or Special in Intelligence. The real name, uh, the actual name is Air Force Office of Special Investigations. It was founded back in 1948 when the National Security Act was created, which, which created the Air Force. The first director of OSI was Joseph Carroll. And he was an FBI agent. He was assistant director of the FBI under Hoover. And he was loaned over to OSI to start this new investigative agency. AFOSI is a federal law enforcement agency. It's a federal, the, all the agents are federally certified to conduct Title 18 and Title 10 investigations. Uh, one of the unique things about OSI, it reports directly to the Inspector General of the Air Force. It doesn't report to a commander on a base. Uh, it reports directly to the Inspector General. And the reason for that is there can be no command influence on a base. For instance, if, you're, if OSI is conducting an investigation on the base and they don't want the commander to know about it for one reason or another, they don't have to tell them. They just continue investigation. But normally what happens on a base is the uh, base commander gets a, um, a briefing uh, on what OSI does. And in probably 60 or 70% of everything OSI does on a base is classified, except for uh, uh, the criminal investigations, which could be something that a, a commander would want to know about. Uh, Air Force operates under federal statutes and it has the following branches, criminal investigations branch. It investigates crime occurring on a military installation, Air Force installation or any installation involving Air Force personnel, or Air Force property. Uh, fraud investigations, any kind of a fraud against the Air Force is handled by OSI. They have uh, computer crime investigators. Uh, and also OSI is the protective service arm of the Air Force to act just like the Secret Service, they protect uh, Air Force dignitaries. The Secretary of the Air Force has a detail of OSI agents protecting them. And then separately from those other uh, branches is a division called the Counterintelligence Division. And under the Counterintelligence, Counterintelligence Division is the uh, Counterespionage section and a Special Projects section. Special Projects is where I worked. It's codenamed PJ, as PJ, uh, I'll, say, I'll say PJ as for special projects when you hear me say it, that's what I mean. Not pararescue, but uh, uh, special projects. They develop and implement security policies and procedures for compartmented special access programs. They guide and direct security related activities of all programs involving advanced research and development. Provides counterintelligence support to Air Force and other governmental agencies special activities operations. Conducts classified investigations and special operations missions to protect vital Air Force programs and projects. And finally, they support operations directed by the Defense Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency. The OSI is the investigative arm of the DIA and uh, the uh, NSA. So that kind of explains what they do uh, and what I did uh, during my time in. Um, every every agent goes through a, a 
very detailed investigation to get in. They, uh, they have to have college. Um, there are military OSI agents and there are civilian OSI agents. They do the same thing, but they, uh, there are some military, mostly civilians, but there are some military. And they go through a number of different schools. Um, if you're in, you, you go to a basic uh, Federal Law Enforcement Academy at Glencoe, Georgia, and then you go to the OSI school and then advanced training, uh, such as I went through. Uh, intelligence operations course, courses within the DIA, CIA, and NSA. Uh, and then we're trained to, to conduct deep cover op operations investigations, um, conduct investigations that require disinformation or deception operations, we call them, and then conducting investigations to allege uh, UFO. Back then it was UFO, now it's UA AP UFO and ET related. So that's what OSI is. Uh, I hope that explains it to everybody out there. And let me go into uh, some of these questions that my friends and other people have a have tried to ask, but haven't been able to. Um, I think one of the biggest questions that all is always answered is, uh, why did we start? Uh, and why did Richard Doty this is a question. Why did Richard Doty start an investigation into Paul Benowitz? Well, first of all, I didn't start an investigation into Paul Benowitz. Uh, I was assigned as an counterintelligence officer at Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, I received a complaint from Lieutenant Colonel Ernie Edwards. He was a commander of the, o of the state police, or excuse me, security police at Manzano Base, which is where nuclear weapons are stored back in those days, uh, because Paul had contacted him by phone. I took the information that Colonel Edwards gave me. I submitted a, a Form 1, which is a incident uh, report, through my supervisor to headquarters. Headquarters came back and said, we're going to do an investigation into this. And... <sighs> For the people out there who've been in intelligence or the military, um, we don't do anything without an operational plan. So the operations plan comes down from headquarters, uh, dictating what we're supposed to do down in the field, and we do it. We follow the plan. So it's not Richard Doty that created all this. It's an operations plan created at headquarters, and I just, I just run it. Uh, another another big question is why did OSI give you give Richard Doty the Benowitz case because you are a young, inexperienced intelligence officer just out of uh, intelligence school? Eh, that's a good question. It is a good question. I was. Uh, I've been. I hadn't been in OSI for well, about fifteen months. I hadn't run any major cases like this before. And so they gave it to me. Now we have within OSI at, at the time at Kirtland, we have a senior agent who was a case um, supervisor. He supervised administratively cases. Therefore, he assigned cases to, to different agents. And um, the senior agents, agents that have been around 20, 30 years, getting ready to retire, they didn't want to touch this. I think they saw the writing on the wall. They didn't want to touch this case. So lo and behold, a uh, person like myself, a young intelligence officer was assigned a case. Now that's why uh, I got the case, I think, although nobody ever told me that, but I, you know, I can put two to two together and figure that out. And uh, okay, why did you drug Paul Benowitz. <laughs> well, we didn't drug Paul Benowitz. But let me explain how that comes about. Paul was a four pack or five pack a day smoker. He drank everything conceivable that contained caffeine. He didn't take good care of himself. So sometime during the initial part of the investigation, which was called Seven Lambs, Project Seven Lambs, um, we had Paul 
examined by a government physician. I'm not going to name who that physician is, but I think everybody out there that's been following the subject for years can figure out who that was. And during the examination of Paul, there were a number of medications Paul was taking. And uh, so the, the government physician recommended some new medications for, for Paul, including a sleeping pill. Because Paul, one of the biggest complaints Paul would make when I went to visit him or talk to him was I didn't get a good night's sleep last night. So, uh, and, and probably because of all the caffeine he drinks. But anyways, they, they gave him a, something, a sleeping pill. So that's probably why uh, you hear people say, oh, you drugged Paul Benowitz. Because some of the insiders might know that we, in fact, uh, did give him some prescriptions. And I didn't, but the, the, uh, the doctor did. So that, I hope, can answer that question. Um, uh, how many other agents... Uh, were involved in the Paul Benoit's case. That was another question. Well, 16. There were 16 total agents, some from the FBI, a couple from NSA, a couple from DIA, and myself. I was the case agent, but there were other agents doing the exact same thing or sometimes more than, than I was doing. Um, I normally got every one of their reports uh, or or, uh, supplementals. Uh, there was one main report. Who did that? They're gone. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so uh, there were 16 other people involved in it. So it's, it wasn't Richard Doty that did everything. Um, Rick, can I, sorry to interrupt you, buddy. Yeah. I just want to because I've been having trouble. I don't know why. Just a real quick question. You mentioned in the beginning the Air Force Office of Special Investigation, and then you said there was somebody else that you said that they were working in tandem with or, or at least parallel with. Who was that? Another agency? Yeah, uh, DIA? Yeah, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and the National Security Agency. Uh, okay, so this I want to be clear because I think other people might not know this, and I don't know this. So you've got NSA, DIA, and the Air Force Intelligence. They're, are they all on equal footing in an operation like this? Is who has oversight? And the other question would be: does, Is the CIA aware of these operations going on amongst these three agencies, and do they have oversight and knowledge? There certainly, um, the CIA would have had some knowledge of this. Not, not. Uh, they didn't have an operational uh, in, involvement with this uh, investigation, but they might have an advisory role in some aspects of the of the of the case, as as would DIA. DIA didn't have a uh, a uh, uh, domestic charter. Uh, that's why OSI did all their investigations within the United States because they didn't have. Anybody could do that. NSA, same way. But uh, there, there are some um, classified reasons why NSA can get involved in something in, the, in, the, in an investigation inside the United States. But we were the federal agency along with... Actually, within the United States, when you're dealing with counterintelligence or counterespionage, the FBI is the senior, senior department. They're the ones that would have... Um, overall control if they wanted it but in this particular case uh they just worked alongside of us they did they didn't have we they, they we remained the air force i remain the primary agency uh the control agency as we would call it okay so let's just say the operation went sideways as an example who would have the authority and who would not have the authority to pull the plug on the operation um, well, in a case like that, would be AFOSI. And now when I say AFOSI, I don't mean Richard Doty. I mean AFOSI headquarters in uh, Washington, D.C. Okay, continue on. Thank you for answering those questions. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another question is, uh, and this it, we came up in a, in a space a, a few nights ago. Um, why 
are you lying about your association with the Central Intelligence Agency? Uh, according to records, you worked for the CIA, not the OSI. So that's that was the question. I think that came up a couple nights ago. Well, that's not true. I worked for AFOSI. But I went to schools at the CIA headquarters. Now, for some particular reason, when you go to a school uh, and it, some some other entity, some other intelligence uh, agency goes through CIA school, those people, those agents have to be uh, employed by CIA. And so during a 10 week course or five week or six week or whatever it is, you're, 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 you're on the role of CIA. Uh, but when you leave, you go back to your other agency. So I think somebody got in records. Uh, he says, I had submitted a CIA records check and it came back with some redaction that you worked for the CIA. Well, I don't think that. I, I asked him to see those records, and he never sent them to me. So, so I, you were trained by the CIA, in other words, but you weren't working for them directly, is what you or even as a contractor. Where can you? Maybe they are implying that you were a contractor for the CIA. No, I wasn't a contractor. I worked for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. I went to CIA schools. Now, <clears throat> when I went overseas, when I was in Europe, yes, we worked alongside. Of uh, we had the operations uh, teams, operational teams, made up of normally the CIA guy would be in charge, and then there would be other uh, entities on a team. So you would work with them. You had to have a CIA clearance. Now those clearances are a little different, uh, and he, and you have to the CIA doesn't trust anyone, whoever they are, whatever agency they come from, military or other DIA or, or NSA, you have to have a CIA polygraph to, to, to have access to anything within the CIA. So, and, and, and I had that when I worked overseas. Okay, um, and now we're getting into some questions about Lazar. Why did you lie about the Bob Lazar case? Well, I had to send an email back asking, what are you talking about, the Bob Lazar case? And they explained that, uh, they said, Robert Teller vouched for him, uh, and Bob Lazar worked with Robert Teller at Area 51. Well, when I sat back and asked him, you mean Edward Teller? And they said, oh, yeah, Edward Teller. Well, first of all, Edward Teller didn't work out at Area 51. He worked at Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and Sandia National Laboratories. I knew Robert, uh, uh, Edward Teller because... He spent a lot of time at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, where I worked for Dr. Putoff. And so most of that's not correct. Uh, and as far as uh, about Bob Lazar, <clears throat> Bob Lazar claims, and one of his follow-up questions was, what's the difference between S2 and S4? I, uh, and I challenged anybody out there, I've done this over and over again, to, to find any place on uh, the Nelson Tustin training range is, that is named, officially named, S4. You're not going to find it. You're going to find an S2, and that's in Papoose area, um, but not S4. S2 is what I think Lazar is um, implying that he worked underground there. Now, <clears throat> according to others that worked there, uh, there were f levels under uh, uh Papoos or S2, and they're called levels two, three, four, and five, and not S4. So um, that calls into question whether Bob actually worked there or not. And I'm not going to go into that because it opens up uh, a Pandora's box. Uh, then they ask who Jerry Miller was. Jerry Miller was a, <clears throat> he assisted in the investigation of Paul Benowitz. He was a Blue Book investigator back in the uh, early days. Uh, and he worked for the Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center at Kirtland. And the significance of that is AFLTEC controlled Area 51. Debt 3 Air Force Flight Test Center at Groom Lake was directly um, connected to the, the Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center. And what is and Apple Tech, Rick? What's Apple Tech? Can you explain that? And when do they control? What years? Uh, Apple Tech uh, controlled all advanced research and development projects for the Air Force from, I don't know, from the 70s on. 
and they still they still do it. So there's three detachments, two at Edwards and one or one at Edwards, one at Tonopah, and one at Groom Lake. And that um, that kind of answers the next question. Um, hey, well, hold on, real quick. But going back to Bob Lazar is maybe the person. Uh, again, you mentioned I don't know a year or two ago. I don't know exactly that that you had come across a uh, somebody that had the logs and that Bob Lazar's name were on those logs, and that you guys are hoping to release that. I mean, that's kind of where we're. A lot of people are waiting for that. I think that if if you were able to produce that or whoever has them, that would assist in credibility. I think on this topic. Yeah, that's going to be released in the upcoming documentary that's coming out late fall that we did out of Area 51. It's taken us forever. I mean, Nellis Testing Training Range. There is a notation on the log uh, showing a Robert Lazar that worked there from March of 87, I think, uh, yeah, 87 or 88, I can't remember now, uh, for like three months. There is a notation. There is there's one down there. And there's another person who has spoken about this out there in podcast so like like i said i'm not i'm not going to talk go into that until you everybody sees the documentary and and listens to what the commander out there says and and the and the contents of that uh control log that uh lists everybody that had access to the nellis test and training range from except for tonopah from uh january 1st of 1979 to december 31st of uh, 1990 and that it will come out some other time. Um, now, uh, people have seen, it's been posted, my entry control badge into uh, Nellis Tesla Training Range. And the question is, why did your control badge for, excuse me, why did your control badge for um, Area 51 why is the, your control badge for Area 51 an AFLTEC badge and not an AFOSI badge? Because AFOSI didn't control the area, and everyone that had access uh, that came from locations other than agencies that are actually signed there ha would have an AFLTEC control badge, not AFOSI. We don't, we, don't we don't control that area, so therefore we wouldn't have our own badge for that area. And that's the reason. Uh, finally, <clears throat> why did you uh, make the Mirage Man? Um, well, Mark Pilkington did. Uh, Mark and John Lundberg. Uh, they interviewed me a couple times, about three different times. Once at the UFO convention and some months after that. Um, uh, Roland Denning, one of the producers, readily admitted that a lot of the uh, interviews were dubbed um to put things in um i was supposed to be paid ten thousand uh, dollars i never been paid uh, uh, mark skipped the country in uk went to uh, switzerland and then uh the azores and um john lundberg one of his co-producers uh was also scammed from mark uh now he's uh he's looking for mark uh, looking for mark like i am but anyways that's the uh that's and i didn't i never signed any kind of contract to work on the mirage man uh, either in the book or uh but i was promised ten thousand dollars and i have the promissory thing that he sent me um you know way back in 2007 or whenever it was so that's what i wanted to get off my chest uh, no. oh, real quick, quick, quick. Uh, are you open? I think I asked you this before, but uh, this would be kind of interesting and fun if, if Mr. Pinkleton had the Coney's uh, to invite him on a space and, and to discuss this. Do you think that would be uh, something that would be interesting? Uh, well, sure it would be, and I have asked him. In fact, uh, I think it was um, one of the podcasts I was on a while back, um, th that was the offer. This guy claimed to know him. He said, I can get Mark on it on his podcast. I said, well, do it. Let's do it. And that hasn't materialized yet. So I'm still waiting on that. You want to go to hands now, Rick? You want to start moving around the room? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. we got fringe. Then, uh, okay, I've kept Joe. a list. I, okay. I, kept, I kept a list. Okay, uh, then you go ahead. You take over. Sure, thanks. It's going to be Carmendrum and then fringe and then Yogini 
and then Osiris, and then I'll cycle a couple people down. There is some people waiting. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Rick, for being here to do this little space. Um, I'm an experiencer, and I have questions about this topic, like big time. Um, and it sounds like you're a very educated man, and it sounds like you've seen a lot and done a lot. So my question to you is, is there affiliation with nuclear power plants and, you, and uh, UFOs? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so my next question, right? So that's, that just answers what I already know, right? Because of my experience of where I'm located and what I've seen. Are you aware of any uh, advanced surveillance equipment that the public may not know yet? Advanced surveillance, you mean ours or theirs? Ours. I'm a Canadian. Uh, yeah. Right? The, yeah. The, 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 all I can say in that regards is that nuclear weapons and nuclear plants and facilities that uh, make uh, uh, fission or fusion material are, are um, guarded well. And some of the uh, security measures around, especially um, uh, Hanford and uh, Oak Ridge uh, and uh, military nuclear weapons facilities are um, secretly guarded or guarded by secret uh, surveillance equipment. Who's next? Okay, next is Fringe. Hey, thanks, guys. Thank uh, Rick for making yourself available again. I was wondering if you have any information on insiders being threatened by greys or any other types of aliens um, with uh, ramifications in the afterlife if they uh, come forward as whistleblowers or if they don't uh, kind of secret keep until their death. No, I... I've never heard anything like that. No, can't answer any of that. Okay, go ahead, uh, Yogini, go ahead. Hi, guys. Hi, Rick. Thank you. Um, I have actually two questions. You said some, something or made reference to Edwards um, Air Force Base, that that was um, a part of something. I, I missed that. That's my first question. And second question is, do you know anything about Operation Looking Glass versus Project Looking Glass in reference to Air Force? Well, first of all, I said Ed Edwards Air Force Base is where one of the Afflatech detachments are located. Detachment 1 Air Force Flight Test Center is located at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Mm -hmm. That's okay. what I was referring to. Yes. And uh, secondly, Looking Glass... The only thing I know about Looking Glass is that it was a, uh, a, a an Air Force project that uh, tried to um, um, look into what the Soviets were doing in the area of psychic uh, phenomena and psychic research. That's the only thing I know about Looking Glass. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Osiris. <laughs> Hi, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Rick, first, thanks for taking the question. Um, about 24 hours ago, almost exactly 24 hours ago, you tweeted out, uh, and I'll quote it, you said, I can guarantee you that ETs have been recovered at crash sites. I no longer have any NDAs. Lou, Grush, and Dr. Davis are speaking the absolute truth. Um, so if you no longer are under ND any NDAs, that means that this information is no longer classified. If it's no longer classified, can you do one of two things or both? Either post that information that's no longer classified, or at a minimum, post the NDAs that you say you're no longer uh, under restriction of. Yeah, um, well, first of all, uh, my NDAs or security oaths, uh, we call them back then, uh, expired um, in 2000, uh, the end of 2000, uh, September of 2001. So I, I'm not under any, any, any restrictions. However, there are special access programs that I had access to that I know 
that I'm not going to talk about because I can't talk about. I tried talking about them uh, a few years after my NDA expired and uh, Air Force came by and slapped my hand and said, you can't talk about those things. I said, okay, I won't. But uh, I had access to uh, crash sites, crash site data in, in a couple different ways. First of all, my, um, my indoctrination into the program occurred in 1979 when I was briefed into the United States government's involvement with extraterrestrials and UFOs uh, that they didn't use UAPs back then. And uh, so I was briefed on uh, everything that we did from 1947, uh, not everything, but uh, a good portion of what we did, historically speaking, from 1947 on to, and this is 1979 that, that I'm getting a briefing. So, uh, and that involved crash sites. Uh, the uh, Roswell, Corona, Polona Peak, uh, Kingman, uh, a couple in Nevada, those crash sites were in the briefing. The, uh, so I knew of those, of those crash sites. So and they were under a dip, various different uh, plans. They didn't have special access uh, programs back in those days uh, when, during these recoveries. They were created later on, 19, I think 1968 and on. But they had special programs uh, that Air Force OSI uh, was involved with to protect the, these programs, a counterintelligence threat, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that's part of the special projects branch of OSI is to protect these sensitive programs. And so that's how I knew uh, Grush and those guys um, probably got the same exact briefing as I did, uh, maybe a, a updated one because I mine was in 79. So I'm sure there's a lot of things added since then. And plus during my time as an OSI agent at Kirtland and in that area 51, I had access to information pertaining to uh, recovered alien or extraterrestrial crafts. I see, I saw some in hangars. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, nobody said that came from a uh, planet such and such. And that extraterrestrial species was flying it, but they told the classification of that craft sitting in that hangar was that it, was an extraterrestrial craft. So I was never briefed into every single thing regarding the subject. So, so, so just to confirm, the information that you're saying was declassified and released from your security oath as of 2001. So 23 years have passed, but yet there's been no documentation from you to support any of that with tangible evidence of briefings or information or data or PowerPoint slides or anything. Is that an accurate statement? No, you're absolutely wrong. I didn't, I didn't classify, declassify. It would have been, uh, nobody has to declassify it. They just said, you're not under that restriction anymore. That when you, when your NDA ex expires, doesn't mean that the information that you had access to is declassified. You, you got that all wrong. That, that doesn't happen that way. And I'm, I'm pretty, uh, Mr. No. Doty, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I am a security clearance holder and part of uh, annual reviews with NISPOM and everything, and an NDA lasts as long as the classification of that information lasts. Well, it didn't, it didn't happen. That, it wasn't the policy and the procedure under the DOD Department of Defense Industrial Security Regulation 5200 when I was in. And when I signed off, uh, when that my NDA or my security oath, if you if you were if you're on fire, in fact, a security person within the government, you know what? There's no NDAs. It's called something else. And and yeah, it comes that, on the SF eighty six, and it's part of your security classification. You're reading into the program, and it takes the OCA to declassify the original material. But if you did sign a security oath or aka an NDA, the NDA will only have an expiration date post the mandatory declassification of that information, or it will be rescinded up on the OCA declassifying that information. So if I'm reading your tweet correctly, by you saying that you're no longer under any NDAs, or as you say, security oaths, that would mean, that would allude to the fact that that information is now 
declassified because if you have the ability to speak about it and everybody has the ability to hear what you say and you're not violating any classification concerns, by default that information is now non-classified. Okay, and I, I don't agree with anything you say, so let's move on to the next question. I'm not going to argue <laughs> that point. That's, that's simply not true. Okay, here's the lineup that I can see. If you want to speak, please put your hand up. There's lots of people down requesting, um, so I need to recycle some people. But we've got Matthew next, and then AKA, Rick, and Emily. And Lucia's, I've got you on the list now. Thank you. You as well, Abbas. Go ahead, Matthew. Thanks for doing this space, uh, Rick. Uh, question for you on a, you were on an interview uh, on Fade to Black uh, several months ago, saying you had or you were involved uh, with some others that had a list of people who had clearances for Area Fifty One that you were potentially going to release, but you didn't have control over that, uh, and included Art Bell and Bob Lazar. Uh, so, what's the status of that? And then another follow up: What do you think of these things uh, over the Air Force bases recently? Do you think? Um, uh, they're not human, um, and the uh, Gang of Eight are, are playing coy about they know what they are or not. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, the uh, I just I think I just talked about the intercontrol log earlier. <clears throat> there is um, a group of people found or got uh, a intercontrol log, a huge log, dot matrix type type printing stuff because we're talking about these the eighty era. Uh, that had uh, everyone that had access to it, to analysis test and training range from January 1st, 1979 to December 31st, 1990. Okay, so um, and it's there's a huge number of people on that list. So what we did, number one, the first thing we had to do was verify that that list was in fact uh, credible. I mean, we, we we just found it and we looked through it. Of course, a bunch of us within the advanced working group, certainly that who had access out there, looked for our names. Okay, and we our names were there, and one of the names that was there was but Robert Lazar. I guess it's the same one. He was there from March of I think eighty seven or eighty eight until June of that year. That's it. The only time he's listed on that. Um, Art Bell was on that uh, list. He was on there, uh, and it really confused a lot of us because his Art had already passed away. And so we went and did a lot of researching and found out that Art set up a radio station out at Area 51 for them. He didn't have a security clearance. He didn't have special access. He just went out and showed them how to get FCC documents or whatever they needed to do it. And that's what Art did. I think his access was for a, a six or eight week period. So that's why Art Bell had access out there. And that was the only reason we could find that he'd had access. Thanks so much, Rick. Okay, AKA, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, Rick. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say uh, thanks for your service uh, to both the Air Force and AFOSI. Um, curious, when when you finished up active duty and decided to make the jump over to OSI, was there any significant event that led you in that direction that you like any, anything you may have encountered or experienced while in active duty that said, Hey, that's the, the, the career path I want to pursue. Well, I, um, to tell you the absolute truth, well, I'm going to tell you the truth anyway, whether you want to know it, absolute or not. I wanted to be a teacher. I really, really, really enjoyed teaching. And uh, so I thought, well, but um, my uncle, Major Edward Doty, uh, was in intelligence, Air Force intelligence. He was famous for the Lonnie Zamora case in 1964. He investigated that for Blue Book and many others. Um, orbs that was uh, sighted around Briggs Air Force Base in, near El Paso and many other cases. And um, my dad, who wasn't in uh, OSI or he wasn't in, never investigated UFOs, but he was in intelligence. Um, he spoke Russian. And so anyways, um, I was given a phone number 
from a college professor to call. And I, I went to a, a job fair and um, I went to college up in the Northwest and I, somebody came along and gave me a number to call and um, I got in. So that's how we did. I, I, you know, some people will say, oh, because of your family, but I, I don't necessarily agree. Uh, nobody's ever told me that. Uh, and so I don't know. Uh, but that's how I got in. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thanks, AKA. Go ahead, Rick Ford. Uh, hi, Rick. Again, I have a, um, a question that in regards to misdirection. Um, would you have to know about, say, a base in Alaska that somehow that it's out there, but it doesn't have any of the typical fences and radars and all that stuff. The only reason I know about this is because I had a couple that went out there and they went camping and, and they had like a three-day hike from where their site was. But what was really strange was when they said the woods came alive, I was like, what, you're talking, you know what I mean? I thought it was predator kind of like action. But no, they said basically a lot of U.S. soldiers, right, that were able to tell them what they had back at their camp three days ago. And told that, you know, they were doing an exercise out there and, you know, to, and they gave them a direction to go in, away from that area, which was kind of strange. And I never thought anything about it. I thought, oh yeah, that could be happening, you know, but now I've seen so much to deal with Anchorage and all that. What's your take on Alaska as a potential base site and underground base site? Oh, wow. Um, I the only thing I know about Alaska is um, there are some secret training areas uh, from um, outside Allison Air Force Base, which is in Fairbanks and Anchorage Air Force Base, which is in, in Anchorage. And um, there are facilities up there that the and then there's a um, an army base right next to uh, Allison Air Force Base. And there's a. Um, Winter training or winter survival training is done out there for both the Army and the Air Force. Um, so uh, there, and maybe maybe they're talking about that, but I I wouldn't know any other secret uh, bases that that's up there. Thanks, Rick. Go ahead, Emily. Thanks for being patient. Hi, thank you. Hi, Rick. Um, we spoke in the summer of last year. I'm not sure if you remember. Um, and I thank you for your time um, that you gave me then when I was asking you quite a lot of questions. Um, one thing that kind of stuck with me that I, after still kind of like researching a lot of this MJ-12 Paul Benowitz debacle, um, was I was still kind of unclear on on your like very early history because one of the questions I asked you was... Um, whether or not you were ever worked or ever claimed to work for the CIA in Laos in, um, I believe it was like 19, what was the date, 1968. And you said, I, I remember that you said to me, no, that you, that you hadn't. But um, there are, some people say that you were on a podcast called The Midnight Hour, where you were asked whether or not you worked for the CIA in Laos and that you answered in the affirmative. And then also um, you, in the uh, released Pratt tapes, Bill Moore said that you were at a site um, that was a listening post that was overrun in either Laos or Cambodia. And then Christian Lambright did a huge amount of research and found a post that you allegedly made, I used the word allegedly, um, where you were talking about uh, two doors tours of duty in Laos. And he traced that uh, yeah. post on a history channel forum that traced it back to you um, and emailed you about it. So I just wanted to get a bit of clarification on what your actual involvement was. Thank you. Okay, you're saying that uh, I worked for CIA where? Where was this? No, I, I'm not saying this. This, this. this is this is an allegation or this is something that you have said multiple times. So you made a post on a history channel website also on was Laos, right? Laos, Laos yeah. the, country, the country of Laos. Yes. Is that what you're saying? 1968. Well, number one, I wasn't around. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't in 1968. That's going to be Richard L. Doty. 
There was a Richard L. Doty that worked for the Central Intelligence Agency, and that Chris Lambright, and there was a Paul, or not Paul, um, uh, some other guy um, that got information. Uh, I can't remember his name, but anyway. Are you saying Richard? Rich, are you saying there was another Richard Doty yeah. that had a different yeah. middle initial? No, it's L. It's Richard L. It's Richard okay. L. Doty. And Richard L. Doty is, is okay. my cousin. My brother, my father had uh, six brothers. Uh, he's uh, a cousin, one of my uncles. He did work for the Central Intelligence Agency. He did work in Laos. He was uh, had two tours in Laos, one in, uh, well, I don't remember the locations, but two in Laos. I never said anything of the sort. Lambright called me and uh, said that you, I posted these things, uh, which is which is a lie, another leather lie. People make things up about me because they they didn't know who Richard L was, and so they're and he actually used Richard L in in those uh, on, the, on the phone call and then a couple of the emails he sent me, and I said that's not me. That's I didn't tell him it was my cousin. I just said it's that's not me. My middle initial uh, is C, Charles. So you go find that other guy. I never told him who it was, but I knew who it was. So, uh, okay, I think Emily, uh, Emily somehow me. dropped down, by the way. That, that's me. I'm recycling people. After they ask the question and Rick is answering, I'm recycling because we have people in the waiting line. Okay. So, Can you please bring so them back? Next, up 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 next up would be Lucius to ask a question. Thanks for being patient, you okay. guys. Let's just move on. That's not me. So you go find the other. You go find. How's cousin. it going, Rick? Yes. Hi. Good. How you doing? Good. Good. This is Alex Zanavitsky. You know, we've spoken a few times on um, oh, yeah. Exposure yes. Tonight and other yes. channels. Yes. Yes. Um, I don't think I've ever asked you about this though. Have you ever heard of a guy named John Searle? How do you spell his last name? S E A R L. Um, allegedly, he has designed some. You know, free energy technology called the Searle Effect Generator that also will create anti-gravity devices. And he started a company um, for uh, space exploration in like the 1950s, 1960s. Mm, no, I don't think I have. He might have. He might have been. He wrote a. He wrote a paper, uh, and I think Dr. Putoff was one of the uh, reviewers of that, but. But I didn't know him personally. Gotcha, gotcha. And then the shortest follow-up question, so I'm going to drop down probably for a very long time. Um, is there a relationship between procession of energy and UAP experiences? For example, in relationship to the procession of the Earth or the rotation of the Earth? Wow, great question. That's uh, <laughs> that's. I wish I I wish I had the mind to understand that or to to explain it. But I I think there is some correlation between the two. I know you know, <laughs> uh, or you probably uh, theorize how that would work. I mean, I I think, but to say I know, you know, is a hard. Yeah, yeah. Thing to say. Theorize. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think uh, in theory, yes, uh, I would say. But um, you know, I don't know anything other than I I could guess, and I would it would be. Uh, you know, I just enjoy it with joy thinking or, or, or looking at formulas or equations. But, uh, you know, if I actually know, no, I don't know. So, sounds good. Thank you for your time. I'm going to go ahead and drop down and um, maybe I'll jump back up in a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Just to update the lineup so everybody knows where they are. Next up is a boss and Tic Tac and Lou Reviews. Then the average Chris, then spiritual freedom, Fletcher, and Hey Ocean. So go ahead, Abbas. Thank you. Uh, hi, Rick. Uh, this is my first time ever doing a space. Uh, so you mentioned earlier in this conversation that you have firsthand direct wit um, direct witness uh, allegations regarding, like you know, ET uh, non-human intelligence craft. I'm wondering. You know, with Brush coming out with his claims, um, have you gone to either like you know the UAP task force or the ICIG to uh, you know to brief them on your claims? Uh, if so, can you summarize in a non-classified manner what information you gave and when? Um, yes. And if you haven't, why not? 
Yeah, I was invited to the Department of Defense Inspector General's office January 2022, and I've spoke uh, on a number of times about this. And uh, they cleared me. Uh, they gave you know they said, okay, you're cleared again. Uh, we're in a skiff. They said you can you can talk about what you did during your time. Uh, they're going to ask me questions. And what they did was they actually pulled out a report that I had authored, an OSI report that I authored back in the early 80s. It pertained to an actual uh, abduction slash contact of an Air Force person with an extraterrestrial. I did the report uh, along with another agent. Unfortunately, that other agent passed away many years before. And they asked me about that case. Now, the ironic part of this is they showed me my report, but it was heavily redacted. I looked at it and I said, well, I don't remember everything I put in this report. And you're talking 40 years ago. And they said, well, can you kind of go through it and tell us the gist of this case? And I did. And I said, can you give me a cleared report? And they said, no, OSI won't give it to me. And that's just an example of back in, back then where one agency wouldn't cooperate with another agency. You know, this is the, no, I, OSI says, here's what you're going to get. And it's heavily redacted. There were pages and pages in, that were redacted. So I said, well, I, all I can do is give, give you a good guess of what this other information is under the black markings are. So I, 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 I couldn't tell. But I was... Uh, they, they talked to me, I think I was in there for about two and a half hours. Uh, they said, and to counter what that other guy said about security, they said, uh, we understand that your security oath uh, expired, uh, you know, whatever the date was, September 30th or whatever. But uh, there's still a classification for a number of these projects. And I said, yeah, I understand. He said, but you're clear to talk to us about those things because we're giving you the, the clearance right now. And I signed some forms. So I was cleared. And uh, so and I answered all those questions. And then in September of 2022, they called me back up there. This time they had another OSI agent that I'd worked with a number of times. We were both in the same room together. It was in a different building, a different facilities than from the first, uh, first briefing in or the debriefing in January. And this time they had the cleared report and they wanted specific details about some things in that report and how we went about doing this and that and this and, and then some other names that were in that report. And uh, again, that report was still classified. I saw, I still saw the classifications up there with the caveats. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about that now because as I know what to say and what not to say, you can always skirt the issue classification as Grush and those others did. Um, you, you don't talk directly about it. Like I can talk about that report. That was an abduction by an Air Force person. She was in the Air Force, female. She went through a, a horrible situation for a number of months. Uh, and there was, uh, I would say, concrete proof that, in fact, she was being abducted. And it wasn't some pipe dream or she wasn't doing this herself. And they were very, very, very interested in, in, in that report. Now, there was another report that I wasn't the author to. The other agent in the room was, but I was assistant, and we talked about that case too. So that's, that's the two times that I was interviewed by DODIG. Thank you. I have one just really quick follow-up. Uh, do you have any plans to maybe following Grush's step to get like a Dobser cleared um, guide to, you know, do an interview with someone like Ross Coltart or uh, Leslie King in the debrief or anything along those lines. I mean, the station is very nice. I think the public outreach with like a major news outlet could be more beneficial. Okay, you dropped off there. I didn't hear the last part of your, what you were saying. Hey, but, um, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm basically just wondering if you are planning on taking Russia's steps to like get Dopser um, approval to like go to some mainstream media outlets, uh, maybe like News Nation or Ross Coltart or Leslie Keen to try to follow in Russia's steps and support his claims as like, you know, uh, another open whistleblower. I feel like these Twitter spaces are really nice, but I think it, they don't get the attention that like mainstream media outlets could provide. Well, uh, <laughs> 
I've done that. I, I have, I work for Gaia. I have over 150 episodes on Gaia. I uh, recently, in the last year and a half, uh, recorded the Doty Chronicles. Uh, there's, uh, I think, 11 episodes out there. It's going to be 30. So I've already went that route. Um, I have, um, I care for what I say. Uh, there are certain things I can't say. But uh, I've been on. I've been out there uh, for the last six years doing exactly what you're saying. I I don't necessarily. Uh, I won't go into details why Russ uh, is is might not be the the right person. But um, and I have tried to write a report a, a, a book. I have a, a manuscript that I went through two uh, reviews. They cut out a lot of it. I'm fighting with them now. Hopefully, maybe the end of the year, uh, I'm going to get a book out. Uh, won't have everything I want in there, but uh, I'll get a book out. Thanks so much, Ray. Go ahead, Tic Tac. Uh, hi, Richard. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to educate us. Um, thank you for this opportunity to ask you a question. Um, so I'm wondering when you – so people, are, are, uh, people get very fixated on this issue – um, it can be very destabilizing. It can be like a sort of like religious fervor that people feel um, that they're like figuring out the truth. Um, and so it can be very psychologically destabilizing for people. And I'm wondering when you mislead somebody like uh, Paul Benowitz or Linda Moulton Howe and you feed them some wild narrative and then they accept it, um, is that fun for you? Is that enjoyable? Well, first of all, I didn't do that. I, Richard Doty, doesn't do that. The government tells me what to do. I follow, I followed orders. I did exactly what the operational plan, uh, and I didn't feed Paul Benowitz any wild stories. Uh, Paul Benowitz was already a believer in UFOs. He was a MUF, a APRO and field investigator. Um, and so he was a full believer in in this in the subject and when he was taking pictures of the um, uh, uh, drones which was secret back in those days we had to convince him that they were an air force secret drone program which is highly classified back then we wanted him to think they were ufos but Paul already knew they were, he suspected they were UFOs. He said they were UFOs. He, he told us that. So I didn't feed him any wild stories about uh, uh, what he was seeing. I just agreed with him. It was a simple, it was so simple, simplest deception operation that I ran, or that we ran. Yeah, yeah, Paul. Uh, you was think was he UFOs, given a computer? UFOs. Was he given a computer? He wasn't given a computer. He was given a a, uh, a monitor by Alan Heinrich and Leo S Sprinkle. He already had his own computer and he had his own monitor. And Alan Heinrich and Leo Sprinkle interfered with the investigation. And they could have been charged by the FBI with that. And they gave him a monitor uh, after we told them not to uh, interfere. And I didn't personally, but other agents did. And then uh, Paul used that monitor for a, a few weeks before he told us about who gave him the monitor. Then we took it back and sent it to a lab to make sure that it wasn't uh, uh, traced. It, was, it wasn't something in there that they'd put in there or it was um, uh, the electrical components weren't changed. But we found it wasn't. It was just a, a monitor that they had bought. In some store and gave it to him, but we didn't give it to him. 